Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. I'm your host, Chris Spangle, and here we are Libertarians. We examine the current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. We toss out the screaming heads and put people before political parties and give context to the news to make you think. Uh, this is a special series on We Are Libertarians called The Swamp Explained, and I am joined by Rob Cortell, a 45-year fly on the wall in Washington, D.C., Rob has worked for Republican presidential campaigns, government agencies like the EPA, and has been confirmed by the Senate to the U.S. Federal Maritime Commission. He's also been a candidate for Congress and Senate. And given his experience and iconoclastic viewpoints, Rob gives us great insight into the swamp that makes up our nation's capital. I got uh, a Christmas card from a patron and friend of the program, J. Mark English. And in the Christmas card, he said, I love the swamp series. Tell Rob thank you. So I'm doing that publicly, Rob. Oh, good. Happy so, New Year. People, you wouldn't expect a series about the swamp of Washington, D.C., where we try to explain it to be popular amongst libertarians, but I consistently hear that people love this show because it helps them to, to figure out what's going on in D.C. a lot. So it's, it's a fun series. There's a special feed that you can get. If you go to your podcast app and search Swamp Explained, you can go back and catch up on all the past shows. And uh, yeah, so how were your holidays, Rob? Let's start there. Oh, well, mine were great. I, uh, you know, I, I um, left the island, uh, took a quick trip into D.C. For, uh, to see the family. Um, everybody flew in and then uh, flew off to Dallas, where my daughter lives and works for uh, Fossil Watch. Uh, oh. And uh, my son-in-law for Aetna. So, you know, it's, we're ensconced in the commercial swamp. Yeah, <laughs> one of my most prized possessions at 15 my mom bought me a red mustang fossil watch and it was really i might, might have been like 12 yes i love fossil watches yeah. so very uh, exciting i have to tell my daughter that she'll be yeah. very excited <laughs> uh lots going on you know yeah, it sure is we we get together every two to four weeks and there seems it just seems like we could probably do this show daily with the amount of things you know in the time since we've met we've potentially started a world war yep um, economy may be slowing down <laughs> um but you having worked for the epa and and maybe give a little bit of your history with the epa um there was an interesting story out recently that you could that maybe you could talk to and, and explain to dummies like me exactly what's going on but donald trump has a habit of fighting the thing about donald trump is that he's at war with his own government and that includes scientists that in his employ yeah uh, so what was the story that came out recently about donald trump fighting with uh, the scientists that he employs well just i think you asked me to remind listeners a little bit of my own history with epa so i actually uh worked for it uh when i was a student at rice university probably almost 50 years ago now, when it was started under Richard Nixon. Uh, and uh, I worked as an intern in, during the year. And then my first real job, I drove across the country and uh, walked into the deputy administrator's office. He happened to have been a Rice graduate, which I knew, and kind of walked out with a job hmm. um, where I was um, uh, in charge of the water quality rules governing um, timber products. And as I used to joke, having grown up in Florida, I'd never really seen a tree. Uh, I'd only seen pine uh, boards <laughs> sawn from pine trees. Uh, so that was an interesting thing. And, and I was only there about three, four or five months and then went on to another White House agency. But um, and of course, since then, um, it's grown. Uh, uh, I did have an interesting run in with uh, Scott Pruitt, not a run in, but uh, lunch sort of a meeting with him about a year ago, year and a half right before he is, was. Is he still the. He's he, gone. Okay. He's gone. Yeah. He was the first administrator. He was the guy who, who wanted to get rid of it. He was the state attorney general, I think in Kansas and, and uh, a, a real kind of a red herring in that particular agency. But I, I remember sitting around um, it's a group of, um, I happened to be in a group primarily of uh, mining executives and who were also engaged in international trade. That was the group I was uh, involved with, the trade group. And um, as we all tell our stories, I sort of told mine that I had worked there at the beginning. And, and he says, oh, you must have been, you must have started in the 80s. So, he, you know, and it, of course it was started in 19, 
70 ish, 70, 71. And he, he knew nothing of its history. And he was subsequently pushed out. And there's a new administrator now who came out of, I believe he came out of the coal industry, but he's a smart DC operator. Um, but one of the first things that he did was fire the members of the EPA's scientific advisory board. And that's most of these agencies have science advisory boards. They're supposed to be independent and provide um, kind of a check the scientific rationale. You know, you want the rules to be not purely political, but it was created in 678 by the Congress uh, to, to validate the agency's scientific methods. Um, so he had fired everybody and appointed his own scientists. And the interesting story this week is that uh, there are four rules, major rules that they have come out with that they're about to publish. Um, one on, um, on uh, runoff uh, into streams and another on uh, um, heavy metal coming out of uh, power plants and things like that. And uh, basically uh, the other day, this science board, which he had uh, had put all his own people on it, decided that uh, three or four of these new looser federal rules were scientifically not valid or not based on science as people customarily understand it. And, and to where did, uh, where did he learn this information that it wasn't scientific, that he could disagree with the science board? Oh, well, I, I'm sure the president hasn't figured it out yet. <laughs> as on most things, as on most things, I'm sure that he, he, um, he knows more than the scientists. I, I noted that uh, one of the other topics we may hit today is the, the uh, Iraq and he has uh, uh, in Iran and he has certainly bragged that he knows more than the generals. Uh, and so, and sometimes that might be true that they, people know more politics, but I suspect they don't know more about tactics and things like that. But, but uh, there are a couple of these rules are really significant. One governs mercury pollution from power plants. And then the other is what sort of chemicals can be used near waterways. And of course the mercury issue is a really, it's a really significant thing. Um, mercury is uh, one of those heavy metals that um, when it's in uh, pollution, whether it's water pollution or air, can work its way into the food chain. And uh, as it's, it's eaten in small amounts by small animals and micro animal, animals and things like that, as they get eaten up the food chain, it gradually concentrates and it causes significant nerve damage in, mm. in, uh, in everything. And actually, I, I studied that years ago when I was at Rice. I had a, a grant from the National Science Foundation to put together a summer program, which employed about 10 of us. Uh, and we would go out every day with a, 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 a boat that the university had given us to use for the summer and nets and scrape up everything we could find and we'd take it back and analyze it. And we proved what people already knew, which is that it concentrates as it goes up the marine food chain. And, um, and so anyway, so I certainly have personal experience with that. Um, so that's one. And uh, the, EP, these, uh, the science board said that um, uh, that and another one, which limits, um, which was intended to limit what sort of dredging and pesticide can take place near small streams and wetlands. The advisory board said the proposal, quote, neglects established science, unquote, that shows how contamination of all this groundwater, wetlands and waterways can spread to drinking water. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've had a number of major drinking water incidents in the last 10 years. And so, um, you know, we have drinking water is an important issue in general that people just assume everything's copacetic, but you know, I'm sure you've read that um, uh, many scientists and public health experts are very concerned about things which you would not think about. For example, if you throw your medicines, your, le your leftover medicine down the toilet uh, or something like that, it finds its way into the drinking water. There's and a ton of, I just, uh, someone, a friend of mine was just complaining about the birth control in the water and how, yeah, much birth control there is actually in the water, not just from dumping the medicines, but also from urine itself. Yeah, well, you wouldn't know whether that's good or bad, would you? It depends on what you're trying to do. Yeah, exactly right. yeah. <laughs> if you're if you're trying to have babies, it's a bad thing, and if you're not, and you just, and you just want to <laughs> sow your wild oats, <laughs> yeah. it's a good thing, I guess. 
Um, but Drink you know, one public it, stream, I guess, is the point here. The that's right. It's, but it, but you'd like to know what's there, and so the pesticide issue is a really, really big one. And uh, the EPA has uh, announced some time ago it's going to relax mileage standards on new vehicles. Um, it's going to uh, it wants to loosen up the the runoff uh, uh, issue uh, and you know pesticides and all that. And so it all sounds great to the uninitiated, but in fact, um, the way they're doing it is not based on science. So that's a problem. And it is kind of ironic that his own board has decided to uh, go after him. And, you know, in the context of the swamp, of course, we, we um, think about a lot of the swamp is, is the professional civil servants. Um, but it's also, uh, you know, there's an old adage that when you're a political appointee and you get into an agency over a period of time, you start to self-identify with, the, with the, the people working for you. Right. And, and they're supposed to be objective, which by and large, you know, we've discussed they are, and they by and large try to execute the vision of uh, an administration, uh, no matter what their politics. But, um, and, and we've also discussed the fact that this is an administration which has never to this day taken control of the government. You know, they, they've left probably a third of the political appointments undone. And there's, I think, this sense uh, at the top that if they don't appoint people, they can't get anything done in the agencies. But the fact is, the agencies just run. And uh, that's, that's the, both the good and the bad side of the swamp. You know, thank, thank goodness the Social Security checks get out and things like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I mean, there's some pros and cons to things like the swamp, which we, we could probably touch on. Like if you're going to make regulations, if there have to be regulations, then don't you want them to be made out of informed data points? I mean, the, the problem comes in was when the data points, like as you see in the food industry, for instance, when you weren't supposed to eat eggs, it was the, yeah. you were supposed to yeah. drink lots of milk. That was the dairy uh, industry influencing a lot of that, that data. But you know, in an instance like this, it's so obvious to everyone certain things are happening environmentally. Like the ice caps really are melting and there are yep. serious problems in the oceans and, and yep. streams with runoff from in industry, from our just our existence. And there's a certain segment of the population, especially on the right and probably many of our listeners, who kind of grab facts out of the air, it seems. And Donald Trump is just the king of this. Like he, he's the, I call him the talk radio president because he's like every talk radio caller <laughs> I ever had when I was at WXNT. And he just sort of grabs facts out of the air based on what he sees on television or may hear on a podcast or may read or, in, or hear in conversation from his buddies. And that is, he just goes with his gut as opposed to, decision making like you might find from a, a science board like this where they're trying to be thorough they're trying to be so sometimes i think anti-institutionalists i might call them um make these knee-jerk reactionary decisions and it undercuts a professional you know institution that is trying to make regulations based in science and fact i mean Maybe I'm committing heresy here by saying that, but I think if we're going to make regulations and Congress has mandated certain things, like I'd rather scientists make it than Donald Trump. Well, yes. And, and of course, this is um, some of this is uh, on the part of the regulatory, the, the administration is purely uh, punishment. Uh, one of these sounds like it came right uh, out of Ken Cuccinelli, who was the, the attorney general in uh, Virginia and now is, uh, uh, and Ken is, Ken is a very, He's, he's a very conservative guy. I agree with some things, mostly disagree with a lot of it, his tactics, but he got into a, kind of a pissing contest with um, some of the scientists up at Virginia Tech some number of years ago about uh, he didn't like the results of some of their studies and demanded access to the, the raw data and they wouldn't, and the, and the emails from the researchers and all those things, and they rightly said, it's none of your business. But um, so one of these other decisions here is that the administration has been trying to push is to exclude from any scientific studies that are used for decision making um, those studies where researchers withhold their raw data. 
And, you know, that's just not, as the board said, consistent with the scientific method. Um, so, you know, these are the kinds of things where they're kind of political assertions being made uh, on the part of the administration and the scientists are pushing back saying, sorry, that's not science. Uh, and that's not the scientific method and so on and so forth. So um, anyway, it's, it's, it's very interesting. It's somewhat amusing. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's disturbing in its own way because, you know, we know that many environmental laws go too far and some don't go far enough. And you would hope that um, there would be somebody objective in the process uh, at the administration side to kind of balance that, but they, they undercut themselves. <laughs> well, it seems like, just like I didn't know Scott Pruitt, well, I, I, I can't keep all these people straight. It's, it's, a, yeah, right. it's a continuous revolving door. And what you've seen in the Trump administration is a shrinking of the competent people. And I mean, at this point, why would you want to go work for, for Donald Trump in any capacity? Because you're either going to end up in jail or you're going to get fired and your reputation <laughs> yeah. will be ruined. Like it's, it doesn't seem to, I don't, I don't honestly don't know. I think the greatest uh, counter argument to his argument against his reelection is how does he staff a second administration? Because it's yeah. always difficult for presidents in their second term to staff. And it's going to, it's going to be profoundly more difficult for Donald Trump because like you said, he hasn't filled a third of the government. Well, and, and then the position he fills that are really the high level ones. He, he's, he's very erratic about, um, how, how he treats the people in, in it. Uh, you know, most people would just as soon not have a public dressing down on a, and people, all, everyone makes mistakes, even at very high levels. And, but you would, you would hope that um, your boss would be willing to sit down with you privately rather than make it a matter of public. I just think about Jeff Sessions uh, when he was attorney general, how often the Trump just went after him, excoriating him in public. Uh, is it really it's shameful um but you're right um i do remember though at the beginning of the administration um someone saying to me um who would work for this guy you know he's such a sexist jackass and everything else that was their characterization and my response was um anybody who is a patriot uh, if the president of the United States calls you and, and asks, you have to give it consideration, you know, and most people who are like that, who you would want in the government, think enough about themselves to believe that they have something to offer and that, um, you know, they like an opportunity to be able to persuade the president or other people to change their mind or to move them or something like that. But I think he's run out of a lot of the credibility around that. An awful lot of people have seen a lot of their friends burned uh, on both sides. So yeah, I do think it will be harder to staff a second one. But you know, Chris, uh, the Democrats are doing everything they can to reelect him. <laughs> it seems, it seems <laughs> you know, so, yes. I mean, this whole impeachment thing, it's, it's almost irrelevant as to whether it's, a, it's an impeachable offense or, or what. Um, I think the act of doing it and doing it in, in such a highly political way has simply pushed people back into their corner. So you've got the people who voted for Hillary or against Trump pushed to one side and the people who voted for Trump or against Hillary um, pushed in the other. And you, you know, everybody's waving their hands and saying that 51% is for impeachment and conviction now, I think, depending on one poll or the other. But that won't change the election results. It just pushes people into their corners. So yeah. it's, uh, it's too bad. And of course, now we have the whole issue of, of the gamesmanship with uh, Nancy Pelosi and, and uh, McConnell. And, and, uh, and that's all pretty interesting to watch, too. And, uh, you know, I think the Post this morning, some, some columnists somewhere said there were four potential outcomes um, ranging from Pelosi not sending the uh, the impeachment over at all, and uh, as your listeners know, impeachment's really indictment, not really um, removal, and so not sending it along until such time as she thought um, she could uh, um, uh, inflict maximum political damage, which might be in the fall, <clears throat> or alternatively, hoping that he uh, doesn't get reelected and then tee it up back in uh, you know in the end of the year and then. Uh, do something there to uh, 
sending it over and McConnell ignoring it or sending it over and McConnell, um, uh, well, or McConnell simply ignoring her altogether and, and, uh, and either running the trial without it or, or, or doing the mock trial, just like the mock impeachment. Um, so there, there are all sorts of iterations of this. And it, again, it's, if it weren't so uh, momentous in terms of the politics of this country, it would be amusing, but it's, yeah. you know, they, they are treating it like a game. So Mitch McConnell, the Senate majority leader, who right. basically controls a lot of the Senate at this point, said that he, um, he wasn't going to treat it fairly. It wasn't a serious impeachment. And so Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, said uh, she didn't directly say, unless she's made statements after the initial one that I'm going off of, uh, basically, it, you, if you read between the lines, it seemed like she wasn't going to send the articles of impeachment to the House until there was a fair hearing of the articles of impeachment in the Senate. And I, I think conservatives kind of took that and ran with it a little bit. And yeah. um, one, one uh, columnist, I think, in the Washington Post wrote that it wasn't an official impeachment until the Senate received the articles of impeachment. And the hilarious thing about this impeachment is having the ability to go back to Clinton's impeachment and watch the very same people say the opposite things like Lindsey Graham. Oh, yeah, of course. In the case of Chuck Schumer, Chuck Schumer saying – you know, the Senate is supposed to be an impartial jury. And then you go back to the Clinton impeachment. Well, you know, the Senate isn't actually a jury. You know, you have the exact, it's literally just cross the other side of the street and pick up the other guy's signs. And it, it, that, well, I think it, most Americans aren't taking any of this seriously is because they don't seem to be taking it seriously. You're in yeah. a one minute and then you're holding it the next. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting. And again, it's sort of amusing to watch, um, both sides play this game. So the Democrats are are outraged, just outraged, outraged uh, that uh, McConnell says we'll treat it politically, and that he says he's not unbiased. And most of the Republicans are not unbiased. But um, I suppose I wonder if anyone believes that any of the Democrats are unbiased and their minds have not already been made up. Nor could they possibly have doubted whether the, the congressman. Uh, you know, uh, uh, running the the in, impeachment, were my, whether their minds were made up or not. So I think everybody's minds have been made up from the beginning on where they want to land. Right. So it's kind of ridiculous. I, I the other thing I do find somewhat amusing too is, no, regardless of where you stand on it, the Democrats uh, to watch them on the tube are saying, um, "Well, this is different than the Clinton impeachment." Uh, in the, in this one, the president has committed a crime, although notably they did not impeach him for a crime. Um, and whereas Clinton was just about sex. Right. And if you recall, Clinton was about lying to, yes, it was about sex, but he lied. He was the chief um, political officer and chief legal officer of the United States lying to a prosecutor. Um, so that, to me, irrespective of the topic, makes it uh, worse and, and more impeachable, probably, and he certainly was impeached. Um, the other uh, aspect of, of that is that uh, I th had thought about it at the time. Here, I was a business guy, and I certainly would have gone to jail for lying to a prosecutor. Yeah. But, but I would have gone to jail and lost my entire assets and my company and everything else if I had had sex with an intern working for me. Mm. Um, so that now that is a really good example of this whole thing is kind of the, the uh, it's not exactly double, it is double standards of the Washington environment. Um, but it's also, uh, it just underscores how much of this is theater. Well, I think, yeah, I think theater is a great way to put it. I think in both of these cases, you have the scientific board saying, we need to follow the scientific method. It's like, well, yeah, but if the conclusion supported different, like, you know that, you know very well, as, as I do, that a board of any kind will choose to emphasize the best case for their argument. Donald Trump is, is in, in his long and weird counter-argument letter to Nancy Pelosi, was presenting his best evidence 
the best truth that made him look good. So are the Democrats. And I think that's why it's confusing for people because you, you hear like Donald Trump say they're out to get me. The deep state is out to get me. And then you see the McCabe's of the world and Bruce Thor and yeah. Page and Strzok and you go, oh, there's some validity to that argument. But then you hear the, the Democrats argument of this guy's, you know, withholding congressionally delegated funds and yeah. that's, that, he shouldn't be doing that either. And so people just kind of throw up their hands and go, all right, everybody sounds right. And I don't know who I agree with. So I'm just going to go with my gut. And, well, or, or with my tribe, exactly. as, as the case, case may be. But, you know, um, again, we have, there's some illustrations here of the swamp and, and, um, and, and, and the professional civil service and everything else. So, so I think it's pretty widely accepted that the Russians intervened in the last election uh, using social media and, and memes and all of these things, which um, falsehoods, which get people all ramped up and, and uh, excited about one thing or another. And they're still doing it. And, the, and we have a number of different parties doing it. And I suspect the Iranians are going to be doing something along that line pretty soon uh, because they have a pretty good um, uh, cyber capability. And um, uh, so you have the president basically ignoring all that and blaming, fingering the Ukrainians, kind of a mytholo mythology here, but um, irrespective of all the hand waving and everything else, the Congress appropriated money to the states to actually beef up their cyber operations. So from the level of the ele election integrity, I think w we thankfully have people working on that, uh, mm -hmm. notwithstanding all of the hand-waving, both on the physical security of the machines and the data and on alternative methodologies. So a lot of states have moved from purely electronic to both printing, um, a record as well as doing the electronic so you can count it, but so you can also validate it with a paper record. Um, what they can't do at the state level anything about is moving large masses of people by virtue of fake information and, uh, you know, insinuations and uh, innuendo and all the rest of this. And, and it's complexified today by the ability to make false videos. So now you can actually make uh, videos of candidates saying something they absolutely did not say uh, by being able to manipulate the pixels in the lips. Um, so that all, that, that's a lot more dangerous and, and uh, some of the major um, social media players have attempted to, to do some things around that, trying to figure out what's false and what's not. And, and of course that, creates its own argument. Do we want, do we want Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg at all um, uh, censoring or deciding what is real and what's not real? So, you know, we have some issues there too. So, and that's much more dangerous, frankly, from the standpoint that, you know, that's pure propaganda Absolutely. And, and people can't distinguish what's propaganda and what's not. You know, I think I read the other day that something like 65% of what you see on the internet is fake. And I would, I would believe that. Uh, yeah, I think that is, that, that sort of goes to the libertarian argument, not to offend our friend Henry Olson, uh, but <laughs> Tyler Cowan, but should the stakes be this high? The way to, to undercut a lot of these threats are to take more power away from the presidency, return to Congress or states or localities. I, I don't, personally believe that there's any way that we can centralize the government more and have it function. It's already not functioning and the way forward is localism. Um, so I, I, I don't, there's never, but there's never really an argument that the, maybe the bigger question is, should there be so much at stake? Should there be so much at, at stake of the presidency and who he appoints to boards and who gets elected? Because it seems to me that because everything is, there's just so much information out there that people kind of give up on focusing on down ballot races. And so they just focus on the president. I can tell you from our numbers, this will be my fourth political cycle with We Are Libertarians, fourth presidential cycle. Mm. Um, it, the response after 
an election or during an election year. I've spent two years working on getting We Are Libertarians, getting the formula right, getting the team right, getting the shows that I want on the network right, getting the look right. I'm working on new graphics. Like, because the presidential year brings so many new people to it. Yeah. Yeah, it does. And people pay so much. They shouldn't. They should pay attention all the time or, or to local races because, but the stakes are just so high at the top level now. It's, I think it's, yeah. that's the thing that really bugs me. Well, that's, that's an interesting question, though. Um, uh, the stakes are high, but uh, it, it, where do the stakes matter? So uh, on the day-to-day stuff of people's lives, um, generally they have not, you know, the, there is a distinction between what the feds, the federal government, and the state government and the local governments uh, can do, the impact they have. Um, uh, although, you know, today, uh, you, the federal government can make massive changes that have real impact. I was <laughs> thinking in December, I was trying to pay my, my um, uh, real estate property taxes before the end of the year. And I'm thinking, well, does it make a difference or not? Mm-hmm. And, and, and then, I, of course, it actually doesn't make a difference. I live in a high real estate property uh, state now and have valuable property, and, and I exceed my limit. And uh, same thing on, on uh, a variety of deductions, all of which were changed by uh, the Congress under Trump, and, uh, which is ironic given that he's a real estate guy. But, um, but you know, you were talking about um, – we were talking a minute ago about information and fake information and how people get it and the stakes. Um, uh, you know, I think I may have talked about this book before. I finished the book by a woman, Jill Lepore, who's an historian in Harvard. So you may assume she's on a left of center, which she is. She wrote a book called These Truths, which is a one volume history of the United States and, and a very, very good writer. Um, and you, you know, she makes some errors in the book. One of my friends pointed out she had um, had uh, uh, said there were jet planes. She had a paragraph in there about jet planes attacking the beaches at Normandy, and there were no jets at that point. And she's since changed it. And another one about Roe v. Wade um, that she uh, she named as one of the parties to it, uh, an individual, uh, the prosecutor who was really uh, not. The person it was really the county by the same name and then um stuff like that but which and she she sort of um starts it out on this thesis of many many people came here most people came here originally to seek freedom for religion or economics or whatever Uh, but parallel to that from the very first day there were people who were brought without freedom. You know, there were slaves in the Spanish colonies and Virginia and everything else. And, and part of the book is sort of the, this, how these two par- tracks parallel through American history and the conflict with that. But, but one of the things she really does well is talk about um, the changes in media and information in modern times. And one of the things she points out is how each of these waves of technology has had a big impact on the political equation, starting with newspapers, literally in the 1820s, and the first kind of the first most paper organs before that were 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 political organs. So you you know you have somebody for the the Whigs and somebody for the other guys, and back and forth. And then in the 20s, you had the first independent newspaper that made the, the took the position that it was going to report the news um, uh, as news, and then and, and opinion would be separate, and then um, and then, of course, you had the telegraph, which was supposed to unite the country, uh, and because everybody would be receiving information of the same kind all at the same time, uh, which was somewhat true, and that changed the nature of elections in its own way. Um, and then, from there to radio and similar impact, uh, Roosevelt's ability to use it, and then, um, and then, to TV, and I think Eisenhower was probably the first guy to use it, seriously use it, and then Kennedy really won an election on it. And then, and now we have um, social media and all of these things. And, but one of the things she talked about is how there was a time in TV when we all pretty much got the same message. And that was when we had three networks. 
And they, uh, under the then FCC rules, they were required to present both sides um, uh, and not take you know, a position uh, advocating for a particular position. And uh, those rules were changed under Reagan. Um, so they do not have to have balanced coverage anymore. And now, of course, we have cable and you know, I turn on my TV and I have a thousand channels. Um, and, uh, you know, down here, as I've said before, we don't get newspapers, not on a daily basis. I can get the Wall Street Journal at the post office. It comes in in the mail every day, day of at noon, but everything else is online. So I started watching television, which I had not done very much for years and years. And it's all that's on is the three impeachment channels <laughs> and then uh, Fox and, and then uh, BBC, which is uh, boring most of the time <laughs> and European focused and then um, the headline news. And then, uh, you know, I rediscovered the ABC, CBS, NBC, and I'm always struck by the fact that, well, they still kind of report the news in a kind of unbiased sort of way. I mean, I'm sure they have biases, but it feels more like news in the old way we used to think of news. But I, her main point was that when there were just the three channels and the regulation requiring um, balance, that in fact, everybody was essentially getting the same set of news and the same set of facts. And, and there was a consensus around what facts were. And that you do not have that now. No, there's no consensus. And consensus is a losing proposition. Yeah. And, and, and it's ironic that you can't get consensus around facts. <laughs> Just a chain of events. Like you can yeah, right. really read Peter Baker and Maggie Haberman in the yeah. New York Times. And uh, I actually just did an interview with Tom Lobianco right before this that'll come out the same week, um, uh, probably the same day maybe as this. Yeah. And we talk about Mike Pence. And in that interview, I talked to him because he's an investigative journalist who's worked for the AP. And I, I, I posed the questions on how do, how do you know what's the truth? How do you, what's your process? How do you do interviews? How do you know that Karen Pence was mad at Mike Pence for winning vice presidency on election night? <laughs> like, how, yeah. how do you find that stuff out? And, and he kind of walks through the process. And I'm, I typically, when I read something in the New York Times, go, I'm sure that they, the difference between the New York Times and We Are Libertarians is that while I work very hard to make sure that I say things that are true, there isn't a second or third layer fact-checking me. Yeah. It's me giving my opinion into a microphone, and with the AP and other news outlets, yes, there is bias because there's bias in story selection, but there's layers of fact-checkers that, that typically will look through these things. Yeah. And what you, what you found in – the Trump administration is that a lot of the stuff that was reported at the time by the New York Times early on has borne out to be true, has been admitted by e. Trump himself that a lot of yeah. that was true, that the Mueller investigation validated a lot of what the Times, for instance, reported. Uh, and But it is personally advantageous to either political side, but specifically a person where truth usually isn't in the equation with Donald Trump, it's easier for him. I heard there's something about a, uh, I forget what the historical analogy was, but the person was basically, I think it might've been Nixon and Woodward basically said, well, he's going to have to just blame. He's just going to have to come after us because he has no defense. <laughs> right. And that's kind of become, that's how you know somebody's just kind of been caught is when they just start attacking the messenger as opposed to what's being said in the message. And that sort of, been the the bad part the anti-intellectual part of the trump era is yeah that we're not now even agreeing on basic facts and well and 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 it's and actually you could call it the conspiracy presidency everything's a conspiracy against him and uh or explanation for actions he took or everything else i i, I was just thinking to myself maybe you and i should start a, a non-fact-based rumor so i i have i'm i'm actually sort of convinced I, I, you know, we were talking earlier uh, before the show about how it's interesting that no one has talked about who would become president if Trump were in fact convicted, and uh, that would be one vice president, Mike Pence. And uh, Pence, of course, is um, people think of him as sort of low key and religious and all that, but he's actually aggressively um, 
uh, self-promoting in his own way, and and um, and um, he he really wants to be president. Now, if I were Trump, I were Trump, I think I would consider getting rid of Pence for somebody like Nikki Haley. Uh, so maybe you and I should promote a new conspiracy theory today that. Um, Trump's going to dump Pence and name Haley as his vice presidential candidate. I, I don't know why you think it's a conspiracy. I heard that. <laughs> I heard it somewhere. <laughs> um, Logan did say that he thought that Pence would be on the ticket, that legally they're kind of starting to be tied together. But, um, yeah, that is interesting that nobody's there. I, I just think, like, the impeachment stuff seems like such a foregone conclusion. And you don't yeah. know. Like we, what what I think listeners need to keep in mind is that when you're in the heat of it, this is one of the benefits of studying history, going back and reading like Robert Caro's book on LBJ or, you know, reading about Watergate. When you're in the heat of it and you're reading the newspaper, that seems really big, but then when you have some hindsight to it, it it it, it wasn't as big, or maybe some of the facts weren't as solid. Um, you know, there's there is there can be falsehood there. And that's why Trump's conspiracy mongering works is because there is a somewhat legitimate argument that there are people within his government working against him as evidenced by the new book called a warning by an anonymous person working for him. You know, there, there are people in the deep state in the swamp who are, are so they're aggressively working after him. And, and I think it's part of what we do here is try to determine like, all right, what is a deep state conspiracy and what is just a person that is concerned for the Republic trying to save it from someone who so clearly has many, many issues and, uh, you know, unilaterally kills the second in command in Iran. <laughs> for- yeah, right. Well, that, that, absolutely. Of course, again, the other thing I was thinking about on that today, and, and, and I'm sure your listeners know that we uh, did a, a drone assassination of of uh, Suleimani, who was the, Suleimani, I think his name, is the, who was the head of the CUD, um, the Iranian um, alternate uh, army. Uh, so they have their own national uh, army, and then the CUD is really the, the, um, the special guard. And um, they're the they're ones who- Really, the Pentagon says that he's responsible for 17% of the deaths of Americans in Iraq now, after the Afghan papers, why would we? Right. Think the Pentagon says, but yeah, I mean, this is not Literally. a person that that has uh, that that I'm mourning the loss of. <laughs> yeah, but it's um, but it, I do think I, I was flipping through channels this morning and watching the various analysts. You know, there, there are days when I I can't most of the time I can't stand Morning Joe, but every so often uh, he'll have a when he's not talking about impeachment, he actually has a group of very interesting foreign policy guys who, who will show up and they did today. Um, and then I flipped over to some other one and I was really struck by the assertions of so many analysts that um, there was no strategy uh, there. Um, you know, I do think Trump is, um, is not strategic, he's tactical, but people in the Pentagon game these things out before they present the alternative. And, and you and I both know that they will have done that. They are not about to, to uh, recommend to the president an alternate course of action unless they actually have gamed it out. And uh, the Secretary Esper, Mark Esper, is a very intelligent guy uh, by all accounts, and he's not a crazy. Um, and so um, I, I think people don't know what the consequences will be, but I I'm pretty certain that that the, at least the the um, the defense establishment has spent a lot of time thinking about what they might be, um, whether they're likely to be strikes on civilians or cyber strikes or whatever. And of course, I you know I think everyone is pretty aware that the Iranians, when they may not be aware, actually the Iranians have a tremendous cyber capability, and um, uh, so it's it's going to be. I, I'm not sure uh, what's going to happen, but. But I, 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 you know, that's just kind of this attitudinal thing. There, there is a set of people who, no matter what the administration does, are going to be against it. And 
um, Hi. <laughs> very well. Yeah, but there are things that they do that you probably think you, you and I can disagree with the method. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, it was about time to punch the Chinese in the nose. Um, but personally, I would rather see our allies with them. And you have to remember that, that, that the Obama administration was the one that let the Chinese form their development bank um, uh, because we weren't aggressive enough on our side. And so, you know, the Chinese thing has been a, I hate to use the term, it's been a long march <laughs> through a lot of administrations. But Well, I think so. Trump hurts himself because he is so knee-jerk that when he does take yeah. action, like the, the killing of this Iranian general, yeah. people think, oh, well, this is probably just him, you know, like him, like he has an Atari controller in his office and he's like, uh, I see that general in Baghdad, I'm going to kill him. You know, and that's just not how the system. You, you, you're starting to sound like Saturday Night Live. Yeah, I think if people understood the process better, they they go, no, this was a systematic. Like they got intelligence. He probably was asked, "Do you want to take this action?" And it was decided fairly quickly because he was on the ground moving in Baghdad. Yeah, but it was yeah. not necessarily him just knee <laughs> jerk reacting. Like nobody thinks that he thinks through a lot of consequences, but I'm sure a lot of other people did think through the consequences before they brought that information to him. I'm sure that's true. Um, I, I will say, though, that what has historically uh, prevented uh, the United States and American presidents from engaging in an assassination um, uh, it has been that we don't want to open the floodgates for others to do the same to us. Yeah. So it, it's, um, you know, this kind of thing does allow, open the, the gates to a quid pro quo. I hate to use that term, but, but it does, you know, so. Is that a bad thing though? And I know that. Uh, no, I think if we're going to go around assassinating other people, then, then, then we shouldn't be invulnerable to the same thing. And I feel the same about information warfare. Like, you yeah, know, there's, I, I don't have a lot of sympathy for the Democrats crying. Well, Russia interfered in our elections when like, hello, <laughs> I mean, nobody interferes in more elections than we do uh, and yeah. for the last hundred years. So yeah. I, I feel like a little taste of our own medicine will make people but, up and go, oh, holy crap. But I, I, I assume you're not taking the Trump position, which is that we're the bad guys too. No, I think that, <laughs> um, it, it comes down to force. Like, is it, is it, uh, is this person somebody that I want to stay alive? No, but it is, I, I tried to think of it in the other guy's shoes. Yeah. If I'm Suleimani. Yeah. I don't like it. Let's take Osama bin Laden, for instance. Okay. Let's go, let's go gold platinum standard of the enemy of the United States here. If you read what Osama bin Laden said and why he believed the things that he believed and he, he wasn't an irrational person. And I think, as Americans, especially somebody who was 18 at the time, you go, this guy's just a monster. How could this person do this? And then when you get older and a little more sophisticated and understand more about the world, you go, okay, that's why this guy made these choices. He's profoundly evil and he's wrong. And he decided to take his anger out in a completely counterproductive manner, but he's not an irrational, crazy person. And I think that's where Americans there are people who bristled at me saying that Osama bin Laden was a rational person. We want to just demonize that other person and that's not how it works all the time. So, well, yeah, I think the, but I think this is where um, we're in this period of history uh, where um, not every actor uh, is thinking through, are there other means for me to accomplish what I'd like to accomplish? That's, this is, you know, partly, partly this is the disintegration of, all of these institutions that were built up after World War II by the swamp mm -hmm. um, to prevent war. So, and they have. NATO was intended, intentionally set up to, uh, at the one side, it was for mutual defense, but it was also to rope into the equation the actors who had started the previous wars. And so a, a different kind of alliance. And that really lasted for 50, 60 years. And and, um, and, and people can't today really don't have any, I think no sense, they have no sense of how um, fearful people were after World War II, which followed World War I by not even 
really 20 years, 20, maybe 20 years, um, from one massive war to the next, uh, and the same actors involved in it, you know, the Germans primarily, but, um, and so people really wanted to stop it. We built institutions, we built the bank, the World Bank, we built um, supportive institutions, OPEC and, uh, and uh, um, all of these various interlocking uh, financial institutions to help countries develop. And we created foreign aid in order to, to um, try to encourage economic growth. Uh, uh, and and stability, you know, there's a, the, the whole theory was that if people uh, could express themselves through a government and, and believe that they could express themselves, that they were listened to, that if they had economic growth and they knew one day they'd be better off than when they started, um, they, the world would be more stable. And there's a lot of proof of that. And, um, and but today we're, we're also, as these institutions disintegrate, it's because I'm not sure they are as responsive to the to the new economic order where um, the, the rich are getting richer at a rate much faster than everybody else is progressing. So, Which, which gives our, uh, some credence to the, let's say the more Alex Jonesy crowd that mm -hmm. these institutions are a way to redistribute wealth to the, to the most powerful and to continue to enslave world, third world countries. And, and, and so when you say, you know, these institutions, while well, yes, it brought about stability, it brought about prosperity. It, it's not fair to say that we were war free, but I think people don't have a concept in my generation and the millennial generation of how all encompassing World War One and World War Two were, especially totally. World War Two. Yeah. And even to Vietnam, because I lived through Iraq and Afghanistan, which 5% of the population fought, if that, you know, which is um, not that probably five, one half of 1%. And, and so that's the tension when, when you're promised by the UN that we're going to solve, we're going to give the world peace and then it doesn't happen. You go, well, this institution's flawed and doesn't work. Why are you taking so, that? But, you know, to, to that, the point of the number you just threw out, um, very few people actually fight the wars in which we're engaged. So right. uh, I suspect the percentage of Americans who actually were engaged in Afghanistan and Iran, Iraq and all those, those Middle Eastern wars to date, if, if it's a half percent of the population, eligible population, um, I would be surprised. Mm -hmm. Vietnam, which felt all encompassing to the society, um, was uh, no more than about 3% of all of the eligible um, Americans, people who are eligible to go to war and fight for the country or fight against Vietnam or whatever, went into the war. Uh, that's because um, half of the population right away uh, could not, that was women, young women. And then a number of people got college deferments, uh, myself included. Uh, uh, the war ended before I was out, you know, and all that, but, and Trump, for bone spurs, as we know, um, actually, you know, we had this big period in the Congress where I think there was one veteran left um, in the entire Congress. Now we all of a sudden we have this big influx of both female and male combat veterans, which I think is a great thing. They they tend to be less inclined to war. Um, the last president who was really uh, a veteran and saw combat was George H. W. Bush. And um, who knows, we'll probably have another who has eventually. But, but the people who, the number of people actually end up fighting in, in the war zone is very small. But of course, the impact's huge. And the cost is huge. Uh, you know, the, we, we fortunately have so many more people who were injured in these wars surviving, but their injuries are frequently horrific. And uh, that's very costly both to, to the individual and to society as, as, as a whole. Wars are bad. I agree. Um, well, we're and, almost, go ahead. No, that's right. I, but, and who knows what we're on the brink of. So it's gonna be a different kind of war. You know, I know people roll their eyes when I say Glenn Beck, but <laughs> you know, he has long said the, the Tunisian fruit vendor that lit himself on fire that began the Arab Spring was the Franz Ferdinand moment. And I've never forgotten him saying that because there, there is maybe 100 years from now when people look back with hindsight, they'll go, the Arab Spring was the beginning because that unrest 
went from the Middle East all the way to, to Brexit, to Trump, to China, to, to Russia. I mean, that, that unrest yeah. in the, and France is still has the, the yellow vests fighting. You have South American countries erupting, Hong Kong. I mean, it, it is a global movement by the middle and lower classes against the upper classes and, and institutions and it really did began begin with that Tunisian fruit vendor, and so and, and what it's all about. Knows where does that? Yeah, well, and what it's all about, Chris, is is um, is the ability or the belief that uh, what you as an individual say or believe matters to someone in a leadership position. That your voice is heard, whether or not they agree, or whether it becomes the end position, and and that can be well-off middle-class middle people like the Hong Kong students, or it can be this vendor who was disrespected by the police um, and made a very powerful protest and on and on. It's quite a, the, the range of politics here is, is all over the place, but I think the, the, the cause is still the same. So well, anyway. We're almost out of time, so that means we end the program with uh, your recommendations for food or drink or attractions if people visit the nation's capital, which they yeah. should. Washington, D.C. is a very fun town, a very interesting town. And while it, you're there, what should people do? Well, I'll tell you, there are so many new restaurants in Washington. I have a list of about 25 that I need to get my <coughs> get myself to. Um, there's a restaurant, seven. some I have not been to yet, seven Reasons on 14th Street, my old stomping ground, Latin American. I want to get to Modena, which is uh, Italian and downtown, and by another one of the great Italian chefs. Uh, uh, there, there's a uh, Wolfgang Puck who came from California to create a terrific restaurant at the now defunct museum. Has a new one out called Cut. Um, Tami T H A M E E on H Street is. Um, near a really cool area, Union Market, which has some interesting sort of um, uh, Burmese. Um, uh, there are some new pizza joints, uh, Stellina. There's a restaurant at the top of the new Hilton, the Conrad, which is especially Hilton, smack dab downtown, a really high end, uh, has a restaurant at the top called Estuary, uh, which is uh, by uh, two chefs, um, Brian and Michael Voltaggio. They had a great restaurant out in Frederick, Maryland, called Bolt. Um, uh, another one called your mo called call your mother. I, I love the names. One that I have tried that's on the list is called Rooster and Owl, uh, 14th Street. Um, it's uh, uh, the, the it's the name for the chef, the nickname for uh, the the chef who's owl and the daytime chef who's rooster. But it's um, it's 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 Asian and uh, and it's not Asian, but it's a mixed uh, variety of of things that include some Asian. Um, Anju is another one. Uh, just, it's a whole um, raft. Uh, another one that, that's currently recommended is St. Anselm, which is known for its meats. That's up in the Union Market area. But um, my goal is to get through a bunch of these uh, and have some new ones to report on All next right. time we're around. Well, we look forward to it and uh, we'll talk. And, and I'll be fatter because of it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds delicious. <laughs> All right. Isn't an estuary, is that a bird sanctuary? Is uh, estuary is where it's like a marsh. It's a uh, uh, it's, uh, part of the estuary of the marsh area where all these baby species uh, are, grow and are nurtured. It's like a, a nursery. Sounds swampy. It is. <laughs> Maybe good. that's why we like it. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us here on this episode of The Swamp Explained. And Rob, any final thoughts for our listeners? Uh, I think it's, uh, I, I'll tell you one final thought to think about as you watch the primaries, we're not even a month away from the first of the caucuses, um, is how Lily White, the Democrat, uh, Democratic um, primary process has become, I think, the very last of the um, uh, non-white candidates uh, dropped out yesterday. And uh, some who were, in, well, uh, there may be one left, um, I guess, um, uh, from uh, New Jersey. Um, Cory Booker. Cory Booker is the last one in, but I don't believe he's qualified for the debate. So, uh, so when you see the debate, it's down to the, it's the all-white cast. And uh, there may be, I think, Amy 
Klobuchar has qualified. Uh, I don't know if there are any other women. To me that, you know, on that note, it's the most diverse field. It's the most diverse field and, and Democrats, the very people who are kind of choosing the, the next crop of candidates. It's like Democrats. Here's my point. Democrats lecture everyone else, including Republicans, about diversity. But they're the ones who chose this field that with their donations. With That's their right. Results, you know, and right. so. And then there's Michael Bloomberg. Betrays their own. Yeah, I, I, I think Michael Bloomberg has had the best line in the entire campaign so far when someone asked him what he thought about all the billionaires in the race. And he said, who's the other one? <laughs> right. Yeah, <between. laughs> so anyway. So it's great. Happy New Year to you and the listeners. And uh, and my resolution is that we do this more frequently. Excellent. Sounds good. I All appreciate right. your time, and we'll talk. We'll talk to uh, you, audience, at a later date. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay. Bye bye. All right. Let me turn. That was good. <laughs>